From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. The markets have been good to investors lately, including the $8 billion Rhode Island Pension Fund, which earned nearly 12% on its investments in the last fiscal year. The state's general treasurer has adopted what he calls a back-to-basics approach, which included downsizing his predecessor's controversial bet on hedge funds. He's also stockpiling campaign cash as he looks ahead to a run for re-election in 2018. Our guest this week on Newsmakers, General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program from WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Treasurer Magaziner, it's good to have you back on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. All right, let's start with good news. We don't always do that here on Newsmakers. As I said, it was a good year, a good fiscal year, I should say, for the pension fund. Uh, the uh, It returned 11.6%, beat expectations, and up year. Other states have shared uh, the same success. I'm wondering if you have Donald Trump to thank. Well, I think that there are a lot of factors. And you're right, first of all, we did have a very good year last year. We made a double-digit return. We earned about $900 million of investment gains of profits, essentially, uh, in the pension fund. And certainly the strong market helped. But I also think that our back-to-basics investment strategy that we announced last year was helpful as well. Uh, As you know, we're moving away from some of the higher cost, more complicated parts of our portfolio and shifting toward more tried and true traditional investments. Uh, And it's working. The implementation of Back to Basics is going well. Uh, We uh, still have some more work to do to finish that implementation, but, you know, the results so far have been very good. You know, but the results, like I said, other states, I think Connecticut returned 14%, right? So the stock market had a lot to do with it. And again, back to my question, it's not a joke. Donald Trump, you know, obviously the market responded well or seems to have to his presidency. So when you compare us to other states, um, you know, you're right. uh, Connecticut had a very good year. Massachusetts had a very good year. Rhode Island in the last fiscal year, we finished ahead of some of the largest pension funds in the country, including CalPERS, the California system, North Carolina, Maryland, Oklahoma. So that's another uh, positive story is that after a period of time when, frankly, uh, we were at the bottom of the pack compared to our peers, we're now moving our way more toward the middle of the pack, which is a good thing. Um, Look, the market goes in cycles. Um, We don't know uh, what the future is going to bring. That's why in the back to basic strategy, we basically have two goals. The first goal is make money in the good years which we have over the last year, Um, but then also stay diversified so you protect yourself in the tough years because not every year is going to be like fiscal 2017. There was a Wall Street Journal headline this morning, quote, analysts are trying to work out what happens to markets in the event of all-out nuclear war. Uh, Aside from how alarming that is, are you surprised uh, the markets, as someone who has to pay attention to this for your job, are you surprised the market's been so strong despite the instability we've seen out of Washington this year? Well, I will say that this week, since the rhetoric uh, on both sides, uh, you know, the Trump administration and uh, North Korea, that rhetoric has ratcheted up, uh, we've actually seen the markets pull back a bit. Uh, So... Uh, this week, uh, the U.S. market is down about a percent. The international market's down between 2 and 3 percent. And I think investors are nervous because, um, you know, you hate to look at it through a financial lens. There's obviously more important human reasons that you want to avoid any sort of an armed conflict, especially a nuclear conflict. Uh, but investors are clearly nervous. You've seen volatility pick up the last few days in trading, which is another sign of investor anxiety. So. Uh, I hope and I think we all hope that cooler heads prevail and, um, you know, we can uh, get back to normal. Do you think the um, current, uh, and when you talk to the the investment folks who the Treasury works with, do you think that this, uh, you know, this this was not really predicted uh, last fall, that we were set for this big run up in the market, earnings growth in big public companies, stuff like that. Do you think it's, it's, are you worried this is, this is sort of a bubble like we saw in like 07 in the market or do you think, you know, we, we have, we, the fundamentals are strong enough that you hope this can last. So we're obviously glad that we had a good run in the stock market over the last six or eight months. That's a good thing. Um, but I said earlier, the market works in cycles, right? And I will note, we have never in the history of the United States gone more than 10 years between recessions. We're now about eight years since the end of the last one. So this recovery may be getting a little long in the tooth, uh, which is why, again, um, we actually invest uh, the Rhode Island Pension Fund uh, more conservatively than some other states 
uh, because you know we do know that not every year is going to be a good year, and we want to make sure that we protect ourselves in the bad year. So, you know, it's great that we made money last year. We also want to have a strategy through Back to Basics where we have some protection in the bad years when those bad years do come. And the reason we do this, I mean, the goal is to get the system healthy again. Um, this is, you know, this is your money, right? This is the people watching at home, public employees and taxpayers, UTED, UTIM. This is your money, the money in the pension Does fund. Does Rhode Island invest more and conservatively, though? Because I remember yeah. you coming on here and be complaining that some of the stuff, which in fairness had predated you, did not perform when there was a dip, I think in 2015, the way you wanted to. Was that all hedge well, funds? I'm talking, or? No, I'm talking about our new strategy, the back to basic strategy. Um, you know, a majority of the portfolio is in those growth assets, primarily index funds tied to the stock market, where you know, that's going to be what generates a strong return in a good year like the year we just had. Uh, but we still have about 40% of the portfolio in more conservative investments under Back to Basics, primarily different types of bonds uh, to give us that kind of protection uh, in those years that are not as good as the year we just had. You brought up bad years. And look, when the portfolio underperforms, your office is the first to say, oh, look, you, you can't look at one year. <laughs> you ha it's, it's the long game. You've got to look at a 10-year snapshot. Look at look, Talk to us about a 10-year snapshot. How is Rhode Island performing over the last decade? How is the portfolio performing? Well, so if you look at a 10-year time frame, that includes the period during the Great Recession, when obviously we had you know, the biggest hits to the financial markets in a generation. So over a 10-year time frame, uh, Rhode Island and just about every other state uh, doesn't show very strong performance. On the five-year time frame, where we've been in an economic recovery, it's better. And you know the future is always going to be uncertain. So real quick, uh, you know, give, it, give us a percent. Are we talking four percent over ten years? Yeah. So a ten ten year performance, uh, you're averaging about four and a half. And what about the five? And a five year performance, uh, you're close to eight percent. Okay. So yeah. are you comfortable? I believe you pushed to have the assumed rate of return lowered from was it seven and a half to seven or seven point yeah. two five to seven? Whatever. We're at seven percent now. Correct. Yes. That's our assumed rate. Is that? Are you comfortable with that, or is that really still too low when you look at the ten-year snapshot? Well, so it was absolutely the right thing for us to adopt a more realistic set of assumptions, because I would argue that unrealistic assumptions were the biggest driver and what got the pension system in such rough shape to begin with. You know, from the year two thousand to say twenty fifteen. Uh, you know, we were assuming first eight and a quarter percent, and then seven and a half percent, and not even coming close to hitting it. And neither was anyone else, by the way. And when you have an assumed rate of return that's too high, what that means is that uh, the employers are not contributing as much during that period of time as they would otherwise. And, and employers means the tax yeah, tax yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, and you're systematically, but you're systematically underfunding the system. If you're just saying, oh, well, we don't need to put in a whole lot today because we're going to make huge investment returns. Uh, then you know you don't meet those huge assumed investment returns. You're digging yourself into a hole. So I think it's important that you have honest assumptions that are more realistic, that are more conservative, uh, so that we avoid the kind of mistakes that were made in the past that got us into the mess to so begin with. So are taxpayers going to have to kick in more now that you've lowered the rate of return? If you have a more realistic rate of return, it costs you a little more in the near term, but it saves you money in the long term because you're not digging yourself into a hole that you need to dig your way out of. So the way we looked at it is, say you're going to earn 7%, regardless of your assumption, whether you assume 7 or 8 or 10 or 2. Say you're actually going to earn 7. Does it make more sense in the long run to have your assumption be right or to have your assumption be inflated? If your assumption is inflated, it may save you a little money up front. But your funded status is going to go down, which means you're only going to have to put in more later. So it's better to have realistic assumptions. It saves you money in the long run. It gets the system healthy faster, which means that for people who are in the system, their cost of living adjustments will come back sooner. They'll have the security of knowing that the pension fund is in a much more stable place. It's better to have more realistic assumptions. Because you're effectively borrowing from the future when you don't That's put right. it in up front. Yeah. Um, one other question on just the health of the pension fund itself. I know one of the big uh, challenges that we've had in Rhode Island in recent years is that 
uh, it was still upside down even after the 2011 reforms where in the sense that uh, I think more money was going out uh, in benefits paid to, to teachers and, and former workers and everything than the contributions made, not the investment returns, but the contributions yeah. from taxpayers as well as the workers. Is that still the case or is that finally in the black? So um, it is true that we are paying out more in benefits than we are getting in taxpayer contributions. Um, that, by the way, is not unusual. I mean, it's not unusual for pension funds to pay out more in benefits than they receive in contributions because you expect to make up the difference in investment gains. I will say one of the challenges that Rhode Island had was that that negative cash flow, that difference between the benefits and the contributions was greater than in many other places. So, you know, the pension reform in 2011 helped with that problem. Adopting more realistic assumptions also helps with that problem. And we're anticipating that that negative cash flow is going to improve significantly over the next 10 years. All right, we have a couple of minutes left before we go to a break. So we might be starting this conversation now, take a commercial break, <laughs> and continuing it. The Journal reported uh, this week a higher number of public safety retirees in Cranston have received an accidental disability pension more than uh, other communities. And so our viewers understand accidental disability pensions are for uh, injuries that occur on the job, they get a 66 and two-thirds uh, pension, which is tax-free. It's the most lu lucrative pension you can get. Your spokesperson told the journal it was a cause for concern in Cranston. What's going on? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So a couple of things. First, if you look at the disability rate across the whole state retirement system, all of the communities, teachers, state employees, etc., if you look at the total disability rate, uh, our numbers are fairly normal. Uh, according to our actuary, uh, across the whole system, the rate at which people are going out at disability is normal compared to what you see in other states, not really cause for concern. However, there does seem to be an anomaly the last few years in the city of Cranston. And what you see in Cranston is police and fire in Cranston make up 20% of the police and firefighter fight employees across the whole state pension system, 20% of the employees, but 40% of the disability applications. So they're applying for disability pensions at double the rate of police officers and firefighters in other Rhode Island communities. Now, that being said, just because they're applying at higher rates doesn't mean that they're all being approved. We're actually denying those applications at a higher rate than other communities, too. But there does seem to be something odd going on there. When you say they're applying, is that is that does the city have to back them for it to get to your level at the state yeah. retirement board, or is it just any worker can put in for it? So the city has to fill out a form where they indicate, in their opinion, whether the individual is disabled or not, and whether or not they're disabled as a result of something work-related or not. And in most cases, the city has been signing, checking the box, saying yes. Um, we don't know why this is the case in Cranston. I've reached out to the mayor and said, listen, let's work together and see if we can figure out what's well, going because on. Because he's pointing the finger at you, uh, Treasurer, I mean, or well, at least at the retirement board, which you chair, because it's the retirement board yeah. that has to approve or deny. Right. But again, keep in mind, the city is signing off on all of these before they even come to us. And we have still, at the retirement board level, denied half of these applications coming out of Cranston, which is a higher rate than we've had to deny them in other communities. So. My message to the mayor when I called him was, you know, let's work together on this. Because I don't want to jump to conclusions, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we don't know why the numbers are higher in Cranston. It could be, you know, just because it's a, a more urban community than others that we have in the state pension system. It could be something unique like that. Or it could be that for whatever reason, the city is faster to sign off on these, or, you know, folks in Cranston are being encouraged to apply for disabilities for conditions that they're not being encouraged to in other communities. We don't know. I don't want to jump to conclusion, but I, I do think that there is an issue there that we need to try to understand. And I want to work collaboratively with the city to see if we can figure it out. One quick question before we go to break. Is, is that, that money is, that's Cranston though, in the end pays those, Cranston taxpayers pay those pensions, right? The state's just managing that Correct. pension fund. Yeah, that's right. State, so the rest of the state's not covering a higher disability rate in Cranston. It's really an issue for Cranston taxpayers. That's right. But I, I think, you know, when it comes to disability cases, the most important thing is that we get it right. I don't look at this as we should be tougher or we should be looser. Case by case, you've got to get it right. Because if there is somebody who is hurt in the line of duty and they're not able to support themselves, they should get a disability benefit. But if there's someone who is not disabled, they shouldn't get it. It's not fair to everybody else in the system. So we've got to get these right. 
something strange is coming out of uh, these numbers in Cranston. We don't know why, but I want to figure it out. All right, we have to, as, a, as predicted, we're going to pause <laughs> this conversation, go to a break, and we'll come back. Our guest this week is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Uh, before the break, we were talking about accidental disability pensions. I remember uh, reporting a lot on questions surrounding uh, questionable disability pensions that were awarded when uh, Governor Gina Raimondo was treasurer. And at the time, in response, her office set up a, disabil a disability pension hotline number so people could call in if they suspected fraud. Does that line still exist? It still exists and people can call our office anytime. Does um, it ring ever? The challenge is, uh, not very often, I mean the challenge is um, there is a court case going on right now that has to do with our ability to do something about it if we come across uh, an issue of pension fraud. Um, right now, it's unclear what legal tools we have as a state to actually do something if we find out that uh, somebody, uh, and so. So it's really at the point of award, isn't it? Right, and that's what the case is looking at. So it, yeah. that's why you, uh, you talked earlier about having to scrutinize um, you know, these disability pensions at the point of award, because we've seen this in Providence yeah. as well. It's very difficult to take back something that's already been awarded. It is, it is very important that we get it right. So case by case, you know, we send all of these individuals to three independent doctors that we, the retirement board, choose to have them examined. We look at, we have full hearings, we look at the whole body of evidence, and we really try to get these right. Are they the same doctors, or do you have like a mix of doctors that you We have use? a mix, and we try to send people to the appropriate specialists. So if it's somebody who, you know, hurts their knee versus somebody who has a heart condition, we will try to send them to the appropriate specialists for uh, the examinations. Let's talk about politics a little bit. You're, are you going to run for a second term next year? That's my plan, That's absolutely. Plan. Uh, people are already buzzing about the possibility that in 2022 we'll have this jungle primary in the Democratic <laughs> Party for governor. It would be you, Nellie Gorbea, maybe Peter Narona, Jim Langevin, maybe Dan McKee, Aaron Regenberg. Could you see yourself running for governor someday I'm if you really, can win a second term? Guys, I'm really focused on next year. I want to run for re-election. I want to continue the work as treasurer. And and when I ran for treasurer four years ago, I did it on the platform that I wanted to use the office to promote economic growth. We've been doing that. We've been doing that through our bank local initiative where we've been moving some of the state's cash to local community banks and credit unions to help small business lending. We've been doing it through the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank where we've put people to work on energy efficiency programs all over the state. I want to continue the work. There's more work to do. My focus is on running for re-election. That's what I intend to do next year. Uh, you know, I want to continue to serve and protect the finances of uh, the people of Rhode Island. Do you support the Pawsock Stadium deal? So I want to uh, fully vet and better understand this proposal because it was very rushed at the end of session. Uh, we've reached out, our office has reached out to the city of Pawtucket to ask for a meeting where they can sit down and walk us through the proposal. You know, the Paw Sox is a important Rhode Island institution. We all want them to stay. The question is whether the deal as proposed is a good deal for taxpayers or not. And so I do want to take a closer look at it. We've asked the city to sit down. We're looking forward to hopefully having that meeting where they can walk us through how they envision the deal working out. And then I'll make a determination about whether it's something I can support or not. Well, it's interesting you mention that because the way the deal is currently structured, it's split three ways on the funding. And the big sticking point has actually been something in your wheelhouse, the debt, uh, the yep. question of who does the borrowing. And Pawtucket clearly is at least somewhat nervous that it's supposed to take as a somewhat distressed city on $15 million of it without the governor set a backstop from the state. You just did that big study of the debt all across, all across Rhode Island and across the cities and towns. Can Pawtucket afford that? Well, it's questionable. And I think it's something that we need to take a closer look at because in the debt study that we did, you know, no surprise, the liabilities of the city of Pawtucket are very high. That being said, the legislation as it was introduced does suggest that there's a state backstop. Uh, if you look at the actual language of the legislation. So it's very unclear to me what exactly the structure of the deal is supposed to be. I want to understand it and I want to go into the conversation with an open mind. I mean, again, we, we want the Paw Sox to stay in Rhode Island. 
Um, but I want to understand the deal. I want to understand what the plan really is. So, so your we can office is going to take a more active role then in looking at this deal. It well, I think like. it's our job. I think it's our job to be, you know, a watchdog and to, especially on issues of public debt and borrowing, uh, make sure that any plan is a plan that's responsible. Um, again, uh, open-minded. I mean, I want to sit down with them, understand it, understand the logic. But um, you know, to this point about whether there's a backstop or not. Uh, in the legislation itself, it's very unclear. One other b debt question, uh, briefly, which is the Narragansett Bay Commission was a red flag in that study. That's, that's the wastewater group. They've been doing that big underground sewer tunnel project. They're looking to get approval to borrow another seven hundred sixty-five million dollars for yeah. the next phase of that project. Is that affordable? So that is a, an issue that I find very concerning. Um, on the one hand. We need to continue the work to clean up the bay, to protect our environment. We're the ocean state. That's very important. On the other hand, when the Narragansett Bay Commission floats $700 million of debt, uh, who's responsible for that? It's the ratepayers in the area that NBC covers. And that includes some of the poorest communities in Rhode Island, Central Falls, Pawtucket, parts of Providence. And so I do think that we need to take a closer look at whether the ratepayers in those lower income communities in particular can afford that level of debt. And we need to figure out what the appropriate balance is between investing in protecting our environment, but also making sure that in those lower income communities, people's sewer bills don't go through the roof. So I think it, it warrants a closer look. Two ratings agencies raised uh, concerns about Providence's, uh, Providence's pension liabilities. Both say the sale uh, or lease of the Providence water supply could help. Dan McGowan reported this week city officials estimate they could get 300 to 400 million dollars for the water system. Should they do it? Well, I think all options should be on the table because, you know, I've said this before, I think particularly the municipal pension systems in Rhode Island, the locally run municipal pension systems, are the biggest financial challenge we have as a state. And in the city of Providence, it is their biggest financial challenge. So all options should be looked at. Uh, I think there are a lot of unanswered questions about the Providence water supply system. Um, for example, does the city even have the legal ability to do a sale, even if you pass legislation at the state level? My understanding is you've run into some pretty thorny questions about property rights and whether the system belongs to the city or to the ratepayers or a little of both. Um, but you know what, if I was the city, I would continue to look at all options. Everything should be on the table. Um, but I think that's an idea that needs a fair amount of additional vetting uh, before a decision is made. Uh, you, you talk about how some municipal and independent pension plans are run. There's some 150 of them in, in the state, if I have that right. Uh, you would like to see more of those uh, plans go into MERS. So that's the state-run system, and, and Ted brought up how Cranston, you know, that, that is uh, managed by the state. You put out a bill to make it a little bit easier for cities and towns to, yeah. to get into MERS. Didn't go anywhere. What happened? Yeah, so um, just so you, the viewers understand the context, there are about 150 local pension plans in Rhode Island. Uh, about 100 of them are already in MERS. So there's only about 40 that are locally run. And some MERS of these, being the state system. Yeah, some of the cities and towns honestly really shouldn't be running their own pension plans. They're tiny. They're not getting any kind of efficiencies, economies of scale. I mean, they, they really ought to be part of a larger system. Uh, we did put in legislation to try to make it easier for communities to join the state system if they chose to do so. Uh, as you know, the session ended fairly abruptly uh, this say. year, and so uh, <laughs> we didn't get that one over the finish line, but uh, I'm going to keep pushing on it. I'm going to keep pushing on the municipal pension oh, wait, issue. That bill didn't seem to be moving even if it had lasted a well, few more hours. We were, we were working on it right until the last day, and we're still working on it. I, I, you know, we need to do something to get these local pension systems healthy again, because if not, it's going to mean less funding for education, higher property taxes, and less retirement security for the people in those municipalities who are working in those municipalities. So I'm going to keep pushing on this issue because we do need to do something about it, and we'll keep pushing until we get something done. So I guess we buried the lead. Uh, congratulations to you <laughs> on your recent engagement to your girlfriend, you. Julie McDowell. How'd you do it? Uh, well, uh, we were in Pittsburgh uh, visiting her family, where she's from, so I uh, proposed out there. Luckily, she said yes, and uh, we're very excited. Pittsburgh is where she's from. Yeah. Please tell me you're not marrying. We, a you know, fan. this is a you. You have uh, revealed my my 
deepest secret. The thing that I has am, given you pause I about am a, uh, getting married. I am a diehard Patriots fan, of course. <laughs> well, but we are, we are going to be an elected official in Rhode Island. We're going to be a say? house divided. We, um, <laughs> you know, I think it was the uh, uh, the AFC uh, Championship last year. We probably didn't talk to each other for a couple of days afterwards. But um, no, but we're very happy. So, are you concerned you. that? Uh, Funding a wedding requires even more debt than that Narragansett Bay Commission <laughs> project. Uh, Says a guy yeah, right. <laughs> who's right. about to pay a bunch of uh, wedding <laughs> bills. I know, yeah. I know. We are um, no, we're we're very excited. So thank you. Uh, do have you? And, and we're spending a, a lot of time on this, but I am curious. Have have you set a date yet? A location? Do you do you go down to Pennsylvania because that's where she's from? You're going to get married in Rhode Island? We honestly don't know yet. I mean, we just got engaged a few weeks ago, and I've been busy with work. She's been traveling for work. We've barely gotten to talk about it uh, since we got engaged. So we don't know yet, but we'll see. And she still has, so everyone understands, she still has a, a year left of uh, graduate school, yeah, at, at Yale University. So yeah. it, was, it sounds like the idea is get that under your belt first. And I think so. I think we're probably going to wait until she's out of school. Um, but we'll see. We don't know. When we have something to report, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Uh, General Treasurer Seth Magaziner, again, congratulations right. on the engagement. Thank you, guys. And really appreciate you coming on the program. Thanks, if sir. you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. And don't forget to sign up for our podcast through iTunes. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.